Very good, yeah. Thomas, um, looks like we have a good assembly of, uh, of participants today. Yeah, so um, my name is uh, Srini Reddy. I'm a professor of marketing here and the head of Center for Marketing Excellence. Many of you would have seen me in person over the last several years where we all organize these Center for Marketing Excellence seminars. And uh, welcome, yeah, so this is a very new format uh, because we normally sort of see each other in person. And so with the COVID-19, we said we should not stop what we're doing. And, and so this is the first adventure uh, using a virtual sort of a meeting. And so hopefully we'll have a great deal of success. And to start off, we have a fantastic speaker uh, uh, to start this seminar series off. So um, uh, keep, uh, keep looking at your emails and dealing and uh, we'll be sending you uh, 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 several programs that we are we are uh, we have planned for uh, in, in September. So at least four uh, four of those, and you'll see some fantastic topics and speakers as well. So anyway, so welcome to all of you. Yeah, um, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, uh, introduce you to Thomas. Yes. Yeah. So Thomas has been a uh, a very good friend of ours at SMU over the last uh, maybe nine years, and I think we were just chatting with Thomas. And we recollect at least nine years ago, uh, he was a speaker at uh, what our program is called Digital Works, which we used to do with uh, um, uh, Omnicom. And so he was one of the earlier ones that we actually were able to get to talk. And so he's been a phenomenal speaker uh, for not only the students, but also the participants who are typically are, are digital executives. Uh, Thomas today is going to talk about innovation. And so the innovation is one of the key areas of his uh, uh, research and expertise which he helps a lot of the companies on. And the topic today is innovation with a purpose. Uh, just give you a brief outline of what, uh, where Thomas comes from. Thomas is now the executive vice president and MD for APAC for RGA, uh, one of the creative agencies in this part of the world. And prior to that, he was there with uh, uh, TVWA for seven plus years. I, I, I knew him when he was there. And, and he has been a phenomenal creative person. He has a team which does phenomenal stuff, and I'm sure he's doing similar stuff at uh, RGA, so which is going to share with us today, yeah. Um, he was actually given an award uh, uh, for Campaign Asia Pacific, and uh, listed as a 40 under 40, um, and uh, he has been mentoring students, and I think we at SMU have, uh, have the benefit of having him uh, advise uh, our students as well, okay. He's been a regular participant in our executive programs on on digital marketing, digital marketing strategy. So anyway, so um, uh, before I release the thing so that Thomas can talk, a couple of quick things that I want you to sort of do. So um, please mute, uh, mute your uh, um, uh, Zoom so that uh, there's no noise that, that sort of filters through. And uh, uh, please submit the questions uh, as, as they arise instead of being able to interrupt during the uh, presentation, which is a little bit trickier uh, in, a, in, a, in a virtual setting, uh, just jot down uh, any questions that you may have, and I and Huling will be compiling them, and there will be three points in time where there's a natural break for Thomas' presentation, and at that time, uh, at the appropriate sort of questions, I will actually field it to Thomas, and Thomas can answer those. So at the end of the presentation, obviously, uh, any of these questions that may be related to what he has already said, uh, can also be addressed. Okay, so just keep that in mind, and uh, and uh, please uh, keep pumping in the questions as you as you uh, listen to Thomas. Okay, so Thomas, I'll sort of back off now, and then let you sort of set up the um, uh, presentation and uh, take it away. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thomas. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind kind introduction, and thank you for welcoming me back to the SMU Marketing Excellence Series. I'm very excited to be uh, to be uh, speaking today, and um, I look forward to discussions and, and any questions that you guys may have uh, in the future. So, as Professor Srini um, introduced, I'm the managing director at APAC for RGA. I manage our business um, across six of our offices in APAC. I've been in Singapore for about nine years now, so I actually met Professor Srini pretty early on um, uh, through some of the SMU series there, um, and I've really worked at the intersection of technology, strategy, and creativity um, across three continents for, for about two decades. So I'm really excited to be sharing um, some of my thoughts with you guys today. Today's topic is about innovating with a purpose. 
And before I go into this, it would be um, irresponsible for me to talk, uh, to talk about purpose in the context of business if I didn't talk about what RGA's purpose is. So RGA, um, us as a company, came together um, a couple of years ago and, um, and really started looking at what, what business do we want to, want to be in, in today's world. And our purpose really is to create a more human future. And for um, about four, uh, four and a half decades, about 43 years ago, our business was started um, on the premise of using design and technology uh, to drive innovation and drive new business models and drive new growth for companies. But we firmly believe that design and technology cannot be done in isolation. I mean, you should never use design and technology for the sake of using them. Um, and we help our, our, our brands and our clients that we work with create a more human future using design and technology. Um, we're a global leader in three related businesses. So um, RGA works in corporate innovation. So helping companies build digital businesses. So either net new digital businesses or pivot their business to have some kind of a digital component. And closely related to this is the digital experience that we build. So we help build digital products and services. I'll talk a little bit more about this throughout today. Um, and then also marketing communication. So we also help companies um, through digital marketing communications and bring their digital products and services to life that way. So in essence, we help companies grow by enabling them to change. And what a better time to talk about change than right now. There's more, th more things changing around us than, than perhaps um, in the near history, if we think about what, what COVID is doing to us, um, and this session, for example, is a good, good, um, it's a good example of that. We would have been face-to-face uh, -face in a classroom somewhere, uh, but now um, with the, um, the use of technology and, and how much we've, we've started embracing technology, we actually have participants in this session from around Asia Pacific, which is wonderful. So um, uh, we, we, we help companies change, essentially. We also understand change relatively well. We've reinvented our own business five times over the course of the last 43 years. So about every nine years, we're actually in the process of defining the next nine years now um, at the moment. And our business actually started um, in Hollywood back in 1977. So this is the iconic Superman uh, title sequence, which is one of the first uh, movie sequence uh, title sequences utilizing 3D back then. Uh, so believe it or not, back in 1977, this was cutting edge technology. So our founders um, actually created a piece of software that enabled you to do 3D animation in film. This is where it all started. Um, and fast forward to today, 43 years later, we help uh, see the C-suite and founders of companies deliver transformation. So in Singapore, we worked with uh, Sing Life, for example, which is a relatively recently relaunched um, insurance technology company. So help transform their brand helping Standard Chartered Bank re, uh, create a new digital bank for millennials, which I'll talk more about in the future um, or in a, in a few slides rather, um, and, and uh, other companies um, that have required transformation to their business. By way of showing just a few examples before I get into the topic, uh, probably one of the marquee projects that RGA have done throughout our history was really the creation of Nike Plus. So we worked hand in hand with Nike and in uh, turning them really from um, really a running shoes and an apparel company into a technology business um, and into a digital business through creation of Nike Plus. And today, Nike has over 100 million members um, in the Nike Plus ecosystem that use the various different apps uh, for training purposes as well as running purposes um, um, and, and experience the Nike brand very differently than you would have uh, a few decades ago. We also helped create uh, Beats Music, uh, which uh, uh, Apple ended up acquiring for $3 billion, which formed the basis of Apple Music. So this was created uh, back in 2014 for, for Beats. Um, we worked with Fossil to create a connected devices um, uh, department or division for them. So when Fossil started creating different connected watches and connected products that were, were really connected to the digital devices, uh, this hardware where division was actually purchased by Google and it became um, a basis for, for one of their uh, wearables to say, uh, divisions uh, over the years. But we also work in, um, in, in brand innovation. So um, last year we helped create a new brand for Pepsi. So Pepsi realized they had um, a gap in their product portfolio, which was uh, flavored sparkling waters. And there were a couple of brands that were really taking this world by storm. And if you look at today's consumption habits of wanting to consume less sugary products and wanting to have these more sort of snackable products that have a bit of flavor to them, but no calories. 
um, we created the Bobbly brand, which is flavored sparkling waters for Pepsi. And um, it sold out in a week um, and sold over a hundred million uh, dollars worth of products in the first year. In fact, it was the fastest growing Pepsi product in their history. And finally, we've worked with uh, Walmart um, in the US. So uh, Walmart came to us with a, with a, with a question around um, you know, how do we actually take on Amazon and how do, we, how do we take on Amazon specifically in e-commerce? And we advised them not to take on Amazon with, uh, in their own game, but rather use some of the assets that Walmart had, which was over um, 3,900 stores in the US and a proximity to customers that Walmart didn't have and developed an omni omni-channel strategy instead, which is, you know, things like curbside pickup, for example, where you can pick up groceries, order them from, from your mobile phone and pick up groceries on your way home and really helped um, you know, start the, the, the resurgence of Walmart stock price, which was at the time at $18 up to 98 in 18 months. So really helped them grow through digital commerce. And then the final example, which I'll go into more detail later, this was created out of our Singapore studio, um, which was the creation of a new digital bank for Standard Charter Bank in Hong Kong. Again, I'll talk more about this um, a, a little bit later on. But what I wanna really talk about today is um, uh, three different areas. So uh, today companies across industries, you talk about almost any industry, um, uh, companies are really confronted with innovation imperatives. And I'll talk about three different areas of this. And what we thought we'd do in today's presentation is as I get to the end of each one of these imperatives, um, we'll pause a little bit and see if you guys have any questions or if you wanna discuss any of these points that, that I'm gonna talk about. But I'll get to the first imperative now. Um, if we look at this is sort of research coming from Harvard Business Review back in 2017. Um, and it basically they looked at Fortune 500 companies and they looked at them from, from 2009 onwards. And what they found was that 52% of companies that were actually in Fortune 500 back in 2009 had either gone bankrupt, been acquired, or had ceased to exist. And the singular reason really for this was this resurgence of digital disruption. And I'm not a big fan of these buzzwords to begin with, but to be honest, if we look at a lot of, uh, lot of industries, different digital innovations have actually helped accelerate some of this change and some of this uh, recomposition of Fortune 500, if you will. And really a lot of this is, is driven by this unprecedented change that we're seeing. So if we look at some of the digital technology and how it's evolved over the years, um, we didn't really see a lot of change for a couple of hundred years. But then when the PCs came around, when mobile came around, when different social media platforms came around, this change has really started to accelerate. So some of the things that we talk about with, with our clients now are, you know, what's the impact of 5G to different devices and IoT and all of these different devices that are coming up? What are, what's the impact coming up on, on different uh, AR, VR type applications for corporate training and things like that? Um, and, you know, as, as we all probably use now, uh, different sort of AI voice, smart home, different, different devices and different technologies are starting to evolve and change industries um, across the board, really. And really, it's no surprise that COVID ex has accelerated this change. A lot of companies are now working from home. Um, a lot of companies have introduced, uh, you know, video conferencing technology, different work share platforms. Um, and, and really introducing um, technology really to the way that they operate as a business. But then has, this has also accelerated the way that um, you know, products and services have had to come to life for the clients um, and the consumers that the companies ultimately service and sell to. And if you look at the economic outlook at the moment is, you know, global, global ec economy is, is not only struggling but contracting. And, and this is a statistic that was taken probably a month ago, and I wouldn't be surprised if this has dramatically changed. So please don't hold me to this being the latest, latest statistic, but the IMF projects uh, global growth in 2020 to fall. Um, and it's very likely as this quote here, from, here says that this year, the global economy will experience its worst recession since the Great Depression. And really it's gonna surpass um, what we saw in the financial crisis a decade ago. There's one major fundamental difference between the financial crisis we saw back in 2007, 2008, and this crisis here. The global financial crisis was very much a capital markets crisis in many ways, and access to capital became an issue. What we're seeing in, 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 in the crisis today, 
is that it's very much a consumer spending crisis this time around. So naturally, when, when retail stores are not open, for example, naturally, when you're not allowed to go out and have a drink or have, have a meal or consume services the way that we used to, it's very hard for us to spend. And therefore, you know, it's very hard for small businesses to strive. And therefore, the sort of um, global business, business supply chain starts, starts hurting as a, as a result of that. Now, there is hope in 2021, and assuming the pandemic really fades in the second half of 2020, which arguably we're not sure whether that's going to happen anymore, um, um, if, company, if government policies and the actions taken around the world are, are as effective as we think they are in preventing widespread bankruptcies and extended job losses further, um, the global economy is um, projected to rebound. And the reason I say this is that when the global economy rebounds, it's likely to rebound with those companies that have spent this year um, changing the way they approach business, changing the way that they introduce things like design and technology into their business models and the way that they service and serve their clients moving forward. There is one major uh, wild card, which is unemployment. So if we, if we really look at a lot of these crises that have happened over the years, and these are statistics from around the world. So these look at China, these look at Brazil, these look at emerging markets and, and the US. Um, the un unemployment rates that we're seeing in 2020 around the world are unprecedented. So again, you know, this um, is going to have huge impacts on the way that people look at employment and the way that people look at how they hire people and also what kinds of sort of remote services and the different digital experiences we want to be providing for our customers and our stakeholders in the future. And what all of this is actually doing is that their customer expectations are rapidly, rapidly evolving. Uh, we're going through a piece of uh, primary research at the moment on uh, the uh, digital experience expectations across APAC, and this is um, across multiple different industries. And what we're seeing sort of some of the early findings is that if, if normal experiences um, are the, the, well, the experiences that we deem as normal today, the expectations of normal experiences are actually exponentially changing. So over time, as we introduce better digital experiences and better ways to consume content and buy things and things like that, it's actually harder and harder now to create these delightful experiences for consumer consumers. And the, the curve of what becomes expected and becomes table stakes is really changing. So we'd argue that a lot of companies um, are at the level of expected experiences and the investments going into design and technology and creating experiences with companies and experiences with brands uh, that are delightful um, is, is actually not yet there. And a lot of this is also um, compounded by the innovation crisis. So we're also at the same time seeing these unprecedented failure rates um, in, in startups. Um, and that, this is really um, due to exponential change. So we're seeing between 40 and 90% of new products failing and 47% of new movers um, also uh, failing. And this is happening across a lot of the industries. So we're looking at finance, education, manufacturing, construction, and information. And what this tells us is that, you know, as we, we all talk about startups being sort of the big disruptors of the big industries, but in fact, there's actually a lot of opportunity for established businesses and existing incumbent businesses to change the way they operate and look at their business in order to be able to actually be the ones that are coming out of this, this current COVID crisis as the winners. And this is a, just another look at it. This is the uh, price, uh, the stock price percentage change that's happened um, across industries. So on the right side are the, are the industries that are doing well. So this very un unsurprising outlier on the right side with internet retail when everybody's home and the only way for you to consume services and buy things is, is remotely, then obviously that industry is doing quite well, food retail um, and, and things like that. But then by and large, most industries have actually suffered, um, again, unsurprisingly on the left side, the airlines and, and businesses like that. So putting all of that aside, uh, if we look at what, um, how we can start approaching um, you know, change and how we can start approaching coming out of this, um, this crisis in a, in a positive way, We've taken a look at the most valuable brands today. So this statistic is a couple of years old, but it hasn't fundamentally changed now. So if we look at Interbrands best global brands list, this is really the list from a couple of years ago. So you have a lot of these sort of what we, we call new economy brands. So you have the Googles and Amazons and, and brands like that in there. But then you also actually have um, quite a lot of brands that have existed for, for a really, really long time. 
So I'll call out Disney as, as, as one example here, because what we really started looking at in this brand, most valuable brands list is that in fact, a lot of these companies on this list are either born from technology. So you have these really obvious examples of Apple and Google and Amazon who've created these new ecosystems of technology, of software and hardware that's really created a, a new way for us to consume music and content and, and all that kind of stuff. So these are sort of the obvious examples. But what's less obvious here and, and provides perhaps a, a, a huge opportunity for a lot of companies across industries is these companies that have been reinvented through technology. So Nike is a good example of that. And we had the privilege of, of really being a part of that journey with Nike Plus and, and, and uh, different innovations that have come through, through from them. But also a lot of car companies have introduced digital technology in the way that they look at their business. And Disney, again, I'm um, calling them out. Disney is a really interesting example because, um, you know, over the, the last decade or, or even longer than that, they've been in the business of acquisitions and acquiring IP. So if we think about their acquisition of Lucasfilms, of Marvel, of all of these different companies, it was really a play to um, complement their existing business of parks and rights with TV channels and things like that by, by getting the best IP in the world. So you have the best movies, the best TV shows and the best sports titles. And then by then, you know, the demand from consumers would follow. Now, if, if we look at what they decided to do a couple of years ago, um, it, was, it was probably not the easiest thing, to, thing for Bob Iger, who was the, the CEO at the time, to go in front of Wall Street and in, in front of their stakeholders and say, all right, we've got all this IP now. We're going to actually start selling it directly. We're going to sell it through Disney Plus, and it's going to be cheaper than the other streaming services in there. And by the way, we will not make money for years. It's a really, really bold decision to make to, uh, to use digital to design and technology, um, essentially, to reinvent your entire business model. And arguably, if we look at how um, what, what's happened to Disney's business now through this crisis, of course, their traditional businesses around um, theme parks, their business around uh, cruise lines and stuff like that are struggling with people not able to travel. But still, um, the Disney Plus business is actually doing incredibly well. So it's just a really good example of how when you reinvent your business early enough, even the biggest crises can have a silver lining, a lining within them. So the simple truth around this section here is that um, if we look at um, around the world, the most successful companies in the world at the moment, the most valuable brands in the world at the moment, they use technology and design as key enablers for driving that innovation. And just talking about an example of how we've helped um, um, a company in, in Asia do this. So this, again, came out of our, our, our Singapore studios in collaboration with our London and Sydney offices. Um, and Standard Chartered Bank started uh, you know, talking about how do we do this as a bank? So how do we actually fundamentally change the banking experience in a way that doesn't um, necessarily fundamentally change our existing business, but creates this adjacent business? And I'm sure this is happening across financial services by and large, where younger consumers are less and less interested in going into the branches and they're less and less interested in, in the more traditional banking services. So Standard Chartered brought this new banking experience to Hong Kong as a, as a first market through uh, uh, a brand that was created bespokely for this purpose. So Mox was created, Mox by Standard Chartered, as a new bank, a bank that was built from the ground up to be digital. So this bank has a completely uh, reimagined, um, you know, um, a banking system in the background. All the backend services have been built from the ground up to support this. The product itself that was innovated with, with MasterCard, one of the first car, uh, numberless uh, debit cards by MasterCard that was launched in the market and a purely digital product that you can open immediately by opening the um, or, or downloading the app and signing up as a customer. And really, um, what we helped with this, with, with this project was to, to create the naming, the branding, and the actual digital experience that went into this. Um, and I'll show you a little video on, on what, what, what went into, uh, into creating this brand and specifically why it was important to create it as, a, as an adjacent digital business rather than um, changing the, the core business of Standard Chartered.
So hopefully that video played well. It's a, it's a really good example of how you can reimagine uh, something like banking when you start from the ground up separately. So when you don't have to worry so much about legacy technology systems and, and perhaps existing ways of working and existing rules of the business. When you innovate um, as, a, as a separate entity and, and, and uh, essentially uh, view projects like this as a startup inside of a major corporation that's funded and backed by all the trust that comes with a bank like Standard Chartered, but then creating this uh, completely reimagined experience on how banking could, could look like. Um, and it really is, is paying dividends. In fact, this launched a couple of months ago and it's been oversubscribed ever since when the, uh, when the um, uh, new account openings have, have opened up to the market. So Professor Srini, this, was, this is perhaps a, a good time for us to pause. Um, the first innovation imperative that I've just spoken about is really um, in times like this, reinventing your business through design and technology to enable this kind of new world that we're, we're, we're living in um, is the first imperative that I wanted to talk about. So it would be great to, um, to perhaps open it up for any questions or any comments that anybody may have. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, Thomas. <clears throat> so we have a couple of questions. I'm going to sort of try to read it out and see if I can paraphrase some of the stuff that it's saying. So one, the question is, how do we define which device or technology to use? through our consumer behavior or the pop tech devices. After all, it is tagged to the industry we are in. As tech is a fast moving and when developing, we take time. How do we ensure we are still relevant? Okay, so I think this is, this is the point that you're actually trying to, trying to make. But uh, the question here from one of the participants is, is there a way that we can define which technology to use? I mean, it's obviously going to be relevant to specific businesses, but are there platforms which essentially uh, go across different businesses that one can think about modifying it for your own purpose? I think that's what I uh, understand from this question. Yeah, th thank you very much. That's a great question to ask. Um, we're, we're always big believers in, in uh, spending as much time in the shoes, so to speak, of the potential customers that you, you want to create a service for. So whether you're in the business of business, uh, business to business, which where you're, you might be talking more about a, a SaaS product, for example, or whether you're in the consumer business where you're creating either selling products or creating services for people to buy and consume, it's very, very important to, to spend time in the shoes of your, your prospective customers. That's the best way to kind of figure out uh, what are the actual behaviors that you're seeing in your audience. And we often talk about behavior-centric design uh, because you know, if the behaviors of your consumers in a particular market are, are very clearly in your industry uh, driving towards mobile, um, so that could be a, a native mobile app, for example, then that's a clear indicator from those behaviors that you should be investing your, your most immediate uh, product roadmap on a, on a native mobile application. If in your industry, um, the behaviors are pointing more towards you know, smartwatch usage, for, exa for example. And Nike Plus is a really good example of that. Far, far more people use their Apple Watch, for example, and the Nike um, Running Club app there than they do on their phones. So it makes more sense to actually direct the most immediate um, development dollars, if you will, into, into the smartwatch uh, application there. So that's the, the most immediate um, um, answer I have. And it, it can actually be as simple as just asking your consumers. I think too often we're, we're shy about asking what our consumers' behaviors are like. The, the build to that, I would say, is that uh, a lot of companies are using innovation roadmaps on two different cadences. So the first cadence is, what is the most immediate platform that we're building for now? It could be a website, it could be a native mobile app, it could be a mobile enabled website, it could be going into a marketplace like Amazon or Lazada. Um, so what, what's, where do we think the most immediate returns are gonna come from and where do we think we're gonna learn the most? And then you may have a second cadence which talks about the sort of net new innovations. So if our business is already built on um, a native mobile app, for example, is there a smartwatch component that we can actually cater for um, and we can actually sort of pilot as, as the next, next stage of, of our innovation roadmaps? Now, also, the other thing I would say is it's very, very important to design your services bespokely for these devices. So what you may have on your, your mobile website or um, um, can be very different than you would have on your native mobile application, for example, because the features and behaviors that they enable are very, very different. So um, those are kind of the three aspects that I would look at this question from. So hopefully that helps answer, um, answer some of it. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas. Yeah, so I have a couple of other questions. I will take one now. Um, uh, is it, how do you measure the ROI for some of the branding campaigns and, and this participant is specifically asking about 
the case that you mentioned with the uh, Standard Charter back in Hong Kong. So this is yeah. an age old question every time you design something. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, there will be questions in terms of are we getting any return from, from, from this investment? So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Standard Chartered example is really simple because it's a net new product and a net new service and net new company essentially that we're, we're la we've launched. Um, so the ROI is ultimately going to come from you know, how many, um, uh, how many new account openings do we uh, achieve? And then how many, um, many of the app-based businesses use a very similar metrics, which is MAU, monthly active users. So number one, how many net new account openings do we get? Number two, how many monthly active users do we sustain? So not just get people to open an account, but actually use it. Um, and then the third one is what the, standard, what the Mox team actually, I, I speak a lot with the CEO of Mox, um, I've actually done a podcast on that. It might be a, a really, really useful one for me to share afterwards, Professor Shvini, for everyone to take a look at. It's on our global website. But um, he talks about hard share. So with, when, when you launch a new service, uh, it's very unlikely that this is going to be the only digital banking service that gets launched in Hong Kong. So it's also very important for us to use our branding and marketing campaigns to be the preferred digital bank of choice. So that hard share of doing things for consumers that they actually genuinely care about um, rather than just doing a, a marketing campaign are, are very, very important things. So three categories. One is what is the most immediate commercial ROI outcome that you want? In that particular case, it's really a bank, bank account openings, very clear cut. Second is, is what's the more longer term brand objective that you want to achieve, which is usually how, how do we actually get, uh, get people to believe in the purpose that we have as a business? And then the third area is, is, is really um, what we call optimization metrics. So how, how do we actually get a robust amount of data so that we can optimize our marketing campaigns um, uh, accordingly? So those are the three key areas, I would say. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, right. I, I mean, looking at the video, uh, when is the Max going to be introduced in Singapore? I, ho I hope soon. Uh, Hong Kong was the first market, but uh, if you look at a business like this, and that's actually the beauty of a lot of these digital first business models, there's probably, I don't want to put a percentage point on that, but a, a vast majority of that business can actually be lifted into other markets, quote unquote. Hmm. Um, so there is a roadmap within Mox to, to launch this in other markets as well, but I'm not sure what the timings look like. Yeah. So what, yeah, just, just a, uh, one short question on, on this, because I mean, we, we know that uh, the big banks essentially were behind uh, uh, quite a bit in terms of these new fintech companies, which are forcing them to do what they're doing. Um, and so Max is a great idea, but uh, they may have actually been able to do it five years ago uh, when yeah. all the other other uh, app app based uh, uh, online banking stuff has come in. So anyway, so I think there is there are these firms that actually learn. I uh, one question we take and then we can continue on with your presentation, Thomas. And this sure. is again we made the pitch that how does COVID affect businesses and so on. So this question relates to uh, one of the participants asking that there are things that we change, right? Contactless. Uh, um, transactions, yeah, maybe telemedicine. Uh, and so we have now accepted as those being okay to do and, and we, which we would not have done six months ago. And uh, the question here, I think uh, the focus of the question here is, are companies taking any particular approaches uh, or directions to reinvent uh, 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 that, that will stand the change of time? Okay, so the idea here is, so they might, we might now have, have to do all of these, but when COVID passes, as it surely will, um, do, uh, do we have to reinvent ourselves? Or are there changes that companies are looking at which, which essentially are not affected by the change of time? Okay, but I, I know the answer, but please go ahead and yeah. No, that's a, it's a, it is a fantastic question again. And, and actually a, a question that we spend a fair bit of time with our clients talking about, because I fundamentally, think that he, us as humans, the human race, we have a relatively short memory. Um, and I think, you know, the, the reason why all the remote working and the remote practices are working so well is that we don't have a choice. We're a very resilient species. Uh, but ultimately, when we do have a choice again, I, I do think that people are going to revert to a certain degree, at least to their old behaviors. So I, I don't think this, again, will be one of these moments where you have to completely change the way that you do your, your, your business. However, um, I do think that um, the, the pace of change now when it comes to different digital experiences and the way you enable your business digitally is there to stay. So it is going to be some kind of a middle ground on, on really rethinking about it from a perspective of if we have a retail presence as a brand, in the future, what does that retail presence, what should it be designed for? 
and we're actually having those similar conversations about our own business. You know, we have an office space just like anybody else in our in industry right now. So we're having conversations about how do we actually change the role of that retail presence? Do we need to have people commuting every day to the office just to work from there when we've clearly pro proven that we can do work that's as good or better when we're remote? So I think that sort of reimagining what the physical experience with, with your brand and your business and your services are is, is clear step number one. And then how can these uh, new, you know, digital ways of working, digital operations, digital uh, products and services, how do they complement or play their own role in this? What I would say though, uh, is that the, the companies that, are, that have been really creative in this, and I'll give you an example, um, are standing the test of this crisis better. So the companies that were very quick to move and try different things. So a good example is in Melbourne is, is Nike again. It's my favorite example to use, but they just tend to do stuff pretty quickly. Um, they actually did a sneaker drop. So they launched a new sneaker. You could order it from a food delivery app. Now, would they have ever done that pre-COVID? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe they would have, but now it just gave the license to be a little bit more creative about how you order that. And then that shoe drop was incredibly successful as we can imagine. So. It's a bit of a long answer answer to to the question, but I do think that there's going to be a role for the physical contact with brands and going back to, I guess, the old ways of, of us living. But then ultimately, um, there will be um, a place to play for, for those brands that really reimagine what the digital side of their business could look like. Okay. Um, very good, Thomas. I think, yeah, so there are questions coming in, but I think we'll defer it for the next, uh, the next break. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, absolutely. And, you can. and in the end as well, we can spend time, time on the questions Great. as well, but I'll go through the next section and then we can um, pause again for, for questions after that. So the first innovation imperative, again, reinventing your business through design and technology. Now, as I've kind of given away a little bit in the topic of this section, um, I really am not a believer in using purely design and technology for design and technology's sake. And that's really what our purpose as a company comes from that, creating that more human future. So beyond COVID and beyond the pandemic we're living in, we're, we're actually living through quite a lot of very topical things that, um, um, that are, are, are getting a lot of press space at the moment. So climate issues, hunger, gender, income, racism, uh, equality, war, terror, all of these different things that are actually impacting the brands and the businesses also that live in today's world. And in many ways, if we look at uh, Larry Fink's letter, so Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock. Um, so if you look at his uh, letter to CEOs um, in late 2019, it really goes, goes to look at this sort of frustration that's building around the world at the moment. So years of stagnant wages, the effect on technology and jobs, the uncertainty about future. And there's a lot of these things that have, have come as, as kind of an anger from people uh, towards the establishment. And what that means is that the trust in this multilateralism and official institutions is crumbling pretty, pretty quickly. So um, also we have this sort of new ruling class, if you will, that's emerging. So already in 2019, if we look at Generation Z and Millennials, um, they're 65% of global population. But also if you look at these two, um, two generations, they're actually on track to have the, um, the largest amount of global uh, income and, sp and spending power. So it is a, it is a major sort of um, um, a focus area. And that's also why so many businesses are focused on, um, uh, on these consumers at the moment. But as we dive deeper into this, um, uh, they have the highest of expectations. You know, if you look at Accenture's um, uh, most recent global survey, this is nearly 30,000 consumers that were surveyed on this. They found that 62% of consumers or customers actually want companies to take a stand on the current and broadly relevant issues. So things like sustainability, things like transparency, fair employment practices, and all these different things. And there's kind of a fascinating movement that uh, has been started lately. And um, we, we, you guys would have all seen this in the news with the different boycotts that brands ha have with, with advertising. Um, in, in popular culture, it started to be called sort of cancel culture now. So seeking to call out offensive behavior and really having this concerted effort to withdraw support for either individual business figures or businesses themselves that have said or do done something that they don't believe in. And, uh, you know, this sort of cancel culture has, has really uh, taken off until either that individual or that business have apologized or just purely disappeared from view. So there's lots of examples of this happening lately. 
And there's actually a fascinating article that came out um, a couple of days ago um, in Channel News Asia about this as well. And, and really these generations that we talk about here pride themselves as a force for social change. So any, anywhere from you know, children's um, uh, you know, authors to Malaysian beauty queens and, and really Singapore general election candidates, um, it seems really that sort of barely a day goes by without another high profile person falling out of, uh, out of this cancel culture. And especially um, in Asia, many young Asians also see it as a way of pressuring companies that they perceive to be behaving unethically to change their ways. So as we start seeing this pattern emerge here, it isn't enough for us to, to, to put design and technology at the heart of our business. We have to do it for a reason and we have to do it for a good cause. In fact, a lot of people now believe that a company and the way the company operates is equal to their brand. So perhaps in the, in the past, brand was, um, you know, how, how a company was perceived um, to the outside world. So it was a sum of perhaps some of the products that they sell, a sum of, you know, some of the marketing campaigns and all these things that we see. But in today's transparent world where everything gets called out immediately, especially your younger consumers, they don't distinguish between the ethics of a brand and the company that owns that brand or its network of partners and suppliers. So the company's actions and the actions that a company really believes in, they have to match its ideals. And those ideals have to actually go through the entire stakeholder system of a brand and a company today. And people don't compromise anymore either. If you look at statistics, this is from McKinsey's True Gen um, study, as well as an article in the South China Morning Post um, um, a couple of weeks ago, about 80% of Gen Z actually re refuse, actively refuse to buy goods from companies that are involved in scandals. And on the flip side, a huge amount, 80% of Gen Z and 85% of millennials say they would act, actively act against the brand if they disagree with its purpose, its values, or its behaviors. So if we think about it that this way, sort of business as usual is, is, is failing in many ways. So the, the, the first kind of data point here on the, the left side chart um, talks about you know, um, uh, millennials who agree or disagree. So it, we're, we're really looking at how, this, how that gap is bridging. Um, and the first chart talks about companies that focus on their own agendas rather than considering the wider society. Um, so there's, there's more and more people that actually uh, agree that companies focus on their own agendas as well as disagree. Um, and that gap is, is, is majorly uh, growing. And on the other hand, the, the gap is, is coming very much together on how people agree or disagree whether businesses behave in an ethical manner today or not. And in the past, this might have been, you know, in the tactics of a business from a marketing perspective, a CSR initiative, but typical CSR isn't the answer either. Um, people, the, again, the gap is coming more together on how people agree and disagree that the leaders of these businesses are committed to actually helping improve society as a whole. Um, and then on the other hand, um, the gap is widening um, with, with people who either agree or disagree that these leaders of companies have no ambition beyond wanting to make money and companies um, as well. And really the imperative for, for businesses is, is if you want to grow, you have to change and you have to change the, the way that you operate and the way that you view the world. Um, but luckily there is actually quite a lot of change in the horizon. So this is an article um, in the CNBC that came out last year. Um, there is a business roundtable in the U.S. that meets every year. So this is a group of CEOs of about 200 U.S. corporations. And by U.S. corporations, there's a lot of global companies in, uh, in the mix here as well. And this roundtable actually uh, spoke about the, the fact that uh, shareholder value, which is typically by Wall Street viewed as the ultimate uh, view of success. You know, what is our shareholder value? How much value are we, we putting back into the, the people who've invested into our companies through, uh, through public investment? But these CEOs all agreed that that should no longer be the main objective of business. And they really reimagined this idea of corporation corporations sort of dropping that age old notion that they function first and foremost to serve stakeholders, but rather should invest in employees, delivering value to customers, dealing ethically with suppliers and all of these things that I kind of mentioned earlier. So um, a lot of companies have started to realize that this is the way of the future now. And in fact, this is a great quote from Mark Benioff, who is the CEO of Salesforce. Salesforce is of course, one of these companies that uh, took part in these roundtables. And, and he says, suggesting that companies must choose between doing well commercially 
and doing good for the, for the greater society is a false choice. Successful businesses can and must do both in today's world. And sort of finally in this section, um, the perspective that we really have for, for businesses and companies is the companies have to make good. So this is from, again, from that same uh, Larry Fink letter to, uh, to CEOs around purpose and profit. And there's some really interesting quotes in here that talk about sort of purpose is not the sole pursuit of profits, but the animating force for achieving them. So in today's world, profits are in no way inconsistent with purpose. In, in fact, they are, um, you know, profits and purpose are inextricably linked. So basically, the more you actually act ethically and the more good you do to the society as a whole and the more you help, the more, the more positive your, your profit um, is going to be from there. So what we talk about then is that companies today have to uh, design their, their businesses around an active purpose. And I talk about designing businesses around that because it's not just about the brand. Brand is a part of it, and I'll speak about that in the next portion, but it's, it's really about, about designing a business around an active purpose. And that's really the second innovation imperative here. So the first one is, you must reinvent your business through design and technology. The second one is you actually build your business around this active purpose and you ensure that it goes through, um, through your entire business. So again, Professor Sweeney, this is uh, perhaps a good time for us to pause for another round of questions. Okay, very good. Let me get my video on, yes. Um, here's a question on, on transparency. Yeah, so there's a, a participant who wants to understand um, when uh, I try to access, I mean, he's giving a put, particular example, access one of the company website in Australia to compare the price of the product, I received the message, I try to access the site from outside Australia and the service is not, not available. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it going to be the trend amongst inter-brand ranked companies in the future? Because company websites lack the transparency which raises issues in business ethics. Where do you stand on this case? Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm 100% behind transparency, but I, I do believe that a lot of these companies, it's not just the transparency issue because the cost of running business in different countries is simply different. So the, the price that you might sell a product in another market may actually be uh, more of a function of the business model in that market and maybe the regulatory um, framework and tax implications and, and all, all kinds of different things. So that could be, so it's, it's hard for me to comment on the specific case around that, but I would say that if you look at all the research from today's um, consumers, if you do not um, act in a more transparent way, then it, it will be difficult to do business in the, in the future, I feel. But there, there, there are sort of just, you know, business realities that, that also go into pricing taxis and things like that. Very good, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> this particular, the second, uh, second uh, issue that you raise uh, is becoming increasingly so even for, from an investment, investment point of view. It looks like BlackRock has taken a firm stand in terms of uh, investing in companies and promoting ESG uh, regarding governance and ethics and so on and so forth. So, um, so it goes beyond uh, uh, beyond just the customers. Yeah. So it looks like uh, firms essentially who do this seem to perform better according to, uh, according to the investment uh, uh, returns. So anyway, so I think this is, uh, this is a, one of the fundamental pillars uh, in terms of how firms need to uh, uh, regenerate themselves. Yeah. So it's a very fascinating point. So yeah, I fundamentally agree with that. I think it cannot just be the brand or the marketing campaigns. It can't even just be the products and services you produce and sell. It has to go through, um, you know, your entire um, your entire supply chain and your entire network of partners um, and, and all of that. It's yeah. it's very very important. Very good. Yeah. So excellent. Yeah. Uh, so we'll continue on 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 for the next segment, and then we'll take any more questions coming along. Fine. Fantastic. So the next section then talks about, you know, putting this into context. So again, design and technology, it's something that RGA as well has helped our brands around the world for the better part of the, the, the sort of four and a half decades we've existed. And then if we look at what's going on in the world today, it's using that active purpose to, to build your business around. So then moving on to um, more of a brand perspective. So how do we actually then bring brands like this to life in, in today's world? So we have this belief of, are building what we call a connected brand. And connected brand really 
has to have that active purpose at the really at the heart of the business and at the heart of the brand and how that's built, as I mentioned earlier. But then, you know, it's really important for us to um, to connect what we call story and system together. And I'll explain what that what that means in the coming slides. So when we look at this from a perspective of marketing, so traditionally marketing and branding practices, they were really developed in, in an age of much more passive media behavior. So the entire industry around marketing and advertising really grew from fundamentally having three behaviors. Either you were watching something and we would interrupt the way that you your programming would do with marketing message, or you were listening to something or you were reading something. That was really, really, really how those, um, those practices were, worked. And in a world like that, you know, you can rely on your story as a business very much so. But as we all know, we're seeing the emergence of a lot of these technology um, driven behaviors. So all of these things on the right here, you're purchasing, you're searching and you're snapping and you're swiping left and right and searching and Ubering and dating and all that kind of stuff online. So the emergence of these new behaviors um, should also be viewed as, you know, how does my brand, how does my company in an authentic way actually play a role within these behaviors that customers are already um, using. So it almost goes back to the, my, one of my earlier points around, you know, if, if you want to uh, design your business, you have to spend time in your customer's shoes and look at their behaviors. Marketing very much so in today's world should also be, be seen as behavior led. So what are the behaviors that we're observing our potential customers, um, you know, um, uh, what are the behaviors that they are actually showing in their everyday lives and therefore which ones of those behaviors can we play a, um, an authentic role in from a marketing perspective? So therefore, if that's the world we live in today, which is true, um, successful brands today have to be built on a new playbook as well. So I've spoken about this a lot already. So these, these brands really center around an inspiring brand purpose. So I'll use Nike as an example. Again, Nike's purpose is really that uh, if you're, if you have a body, you're an athlete. So, we want to inspire everyone to become athletes. That's really what, what they, um, uh, they, they do. And therefore Nike Plus, for example, was created for everyday athletes to be able to be more active and encourage and coach and help people to become more active with, with their lives. And then, you know, in today's world, we create value with these innovation, innovative products and services, as I mentioned earlier. So using design and technology. So this is an example of how, you know, Nike moved into you being able to design your own shoes and you, have sort of holograms in retail spaces that enable you to um, use use different things to to imagine what your shoes could look like. And um, we actually, out of our, um, out of our Singapore studio, created this um, this VR headset that you can use in retail to be able to design your shoes and then see exactly what those shoes look like and then order them online. So you don't have to carry every variation of everything um, in the in the stores, but you're you're able to to visualize for people what that product could look like before you order it. And then you connect everything into this ecosystem. So Nike, again, is a good example of ecosystems. And I, by the way, totally understand that not every, not, not every industry can, can do an ecosystem in, in the same way, but it's just to illustrate a point. So when you have this ecosystem of, of something like a Nike Plus, where you start, you start being able to be in control of your, your, your own data and be able to actually use the, the, uh, the way that you engage with, with, with a brand and with a company in the way that you consume their product. So if you're a long distance runner, we can automatically kind of give you a different uh, suggestion of what kinds of shoes you might want to want to be investing in for you to enjoy that long distance running a little bit more. And when you do have that community of people that use your services, you can create that community into members. So um, Nike, for example, very often launches different challenges around the world through the um, Apple Watch um, Nike Training Club and Running Club applications where people from around the world can, can be a members of a community and actually do a run together, even if you're not physically in the same space. In fact, there was kind of a resurgence of this during COVID where, you know, running clubs, for example, were still running, but they're running individually. So rather than coming together, people were using these connected applications to actually go do the runs that they would normally do. They can still compare times against each other and things like that, but they didn't have to do it together, which enabled this social distancing way of becoming active and remaining as members of this brand's community. And then, you know, as, as was a, re a really good question in the first section was then these, these sort of brands come to life through interfaces and experiences that then inhibit these modern behaviors. So I've mentioned this uh, multiple times now already, but really, really talking about how does your audience want to engage with your brand? And if it is through something like an Apple Watch app, then by all means, that's where the investment should go into. 
And that's where I should be experiencing the brand rather than all, only through something like a TV commercial, which would have been the way brands are marketed um, in, in the past. So if we think about it this way, the traditional approach to branding it, it ignores these sort of consumer behaviors of today. So it's always been sort of a top-down approach of what we say as a brand. And, and we believe that that should be complemented by these technology habits and this bottom-up culture and this new playbook for successful brands, which is really what do we do as a brand for you, consumer? Um, and when you complement these things, things together, that's really where, where a lot of the modern sort of connected brand mentality comes to life. So connecting the belief of a company, the belief of a brand, uh, in essence, what we say to consumers has to be connected in today's world with our behavior as a business and a brand, or in essence, what we do. So connect, connecting the say and the do for a business, connecting the belief and the behavior, and connecting what we call the story and the system of a brand to, uh, together is really, really essential. And if we look at the previous section that I spoke about, it really talks to this. If we say one thing in, publicly, but we don't fundamentally act like that on behalf of our consumers, then that disconnect will lead into a pretty big backlash um, in today's world. And an example, this is an example of something that uh, we uh, launched uh, last week, actually. So this was what the, uh, um, uh, uh, the Mamba Mentality Week, which was really inspired by, uh, by Kobe Bryant um, and, and his birthday. So we, there's a, a week that was launched of uh, the Mamba Mentality Week that was launched on Nike's uh, uh, website. Um, so this is really a movement. There's actually another um, communications agency that did the sort of hero film on this. Um, um, uh, and then we were involved in kind of creating a lot of this content that, that was in there. So if we think about Nike's kind of purpose of inspiring people to move and inspiring everybody to move, how do we take something like uh, the Mamba Mentality Movement and inspire people to do so? So it, it's not just about saying that this is what we believe in as a company, but you know, also enabling these, these moments for people. So this website has um, you know, things around uh, content. So how do we utilize Nike's ambassadors from around the world to talk about things like what passion means for sports today and getting these really sort of um, actionable tips from, from themselves and really a production that was done during COVID time. So it looks like you're on, on, a, on a Zoom call with these, these, these superstars and these athletes um, and they talk about the role of passion and the role of focus and the role of honesty and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, because we, we, we talk about these things and this is what we say, we also then enable uh, people to actually be, get involved. So this is what we do as a brand, which is hosting live training sessions and a live stream podcast on, um, on how Nike's uh, performance director looks at um, how they develop some of their products with the WNBA, for example, and how they actually put the Mamba mentality to work. But then finally also connecting that with what we properly do as a brand and enabling different challenges in the Nike training club and different sort of um, distance running um, um, initiatives in Nike Running Club that everybody around the world can then take part in. So you move away from this sort of passive brand consumption of us just saying something and talking about something like the Mamba Mentality Week. We also do that, but we enable people to really take part in that brand and really um, um, experience it through what makes sense for their lives, which is these training and these running initiatives. So in many ways, if we think about how businesses are built today, it's really this connected brand is an end-to-end -end thing. So if you build our business around an active purpose, um, and the active purpose at RGA, for example, is, is we, you know, we create a more human future, and we do that by um, our business model, which is, which is really built from that. So how do we build digital products and services and purpose statements for businesses that actually help create a more human future? How do you then build your operations as a business accordingly? So how do we use ethically sourced you know, uh, products and components in, in our products? And how do we use um, you know, transparency in our supply chains and things like that? And therefore the products and services we create are really built from that active purpose. Um, and then naturally from there, the customer experience and communications have to be tied to that as well. So it's really this end-to-end -end view that starts from purpose and then ultimately ends in all of the aspects of the business being tied to this purpose. And the alternative is a broken brand experience. So if we look at something like, um, you, know, um, you know, Gillette getting, uh, getting some, some negative press around, you know, fast company calling, calling them out saying, don't give a Gillette credit unless it does more than making an ad. Um, and this, this is really a, a quote from this article, which is if brands are going to lean into social purpose, raising awareness is not enough. There needs to be a genuine, informed, long-term commitment to that issue. Otherwise, people are going to call it out. 
But on the flip side, the other alternative is a broken um, brand experience as well. As we expand into other markets and, and, and modes, it's really important that when you're getting into an Uber, for example, um, that you know it's an Uber product. So you know you can't achieve that w with uh, with just their, their 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 technology system. So Uber had to reimagine what their brand stood for as well. So neither one of these extremes um, delivers, uh, delivers the full impact. So if you only focus on the story of your brand and what you say as a company, um, you're not gonna succeed in today's world, I believe. And if you only focus on what you do as a brand, so only focus on the system and the functional side of it, you're also not going to succeed. So bringing these two together and making sure they're built from an active purpose is really what is going to drive success. And you also don't have to really take my word for it or our word for it as a company, because if we look at some of the statistics around this, connected brands do actually resonate. So the brands that actually focus principally on positive utility um, have a five-year growth rate of 14% compared to 2.3% only for those that largely rely just on storytelling. So if you, if you uh, combine storytelling and that positive utility that you can bring into people's lives, especially in times like this, your growth rate actually uh, goes up uh, quite significantly as a business. But also looking at um, Boston Consulting Group's study around uh, ESG, um, connected brands do drive profit as well. So if we look at valuations of companies and if you look at margin premiums, they are linked to certain ESG topics. So there's quite significant valuation premiums as well as margin premiums for businesses that in oil and gas, for example, not just talk about that, but also maintain genuine health and safety programs or things like consumer packaged goods, you know, actually believe in conserving water or minimizing the impact of their products and packaging. So if you actually do the things and talk about the things, it has, a, uh, has actually a, a commercial outcome to your business as well. And then also talking about it from a perspective of, uh, of recovery. So Connected Brands uh, recovered nine times faster during the last recession. So this was looking at um, Brand Z index um, and the top 10 powerful brands that were built as connected brands, they actually recovered much faster from the previous crisis. So it is actually a bit of a crisis proof, um, a proof way of, of building a brand as well. So the third imperative then is if you reinvent your business through design and technology, and then you build your business around an active purpose is that these connected brands really do resonate. So, so that's kind of the way to bring all of this to life. And perhaps again, Professor Sine, this is a good, a good, good time to do um, um, a, a question and answer session. I will close after this with, um, you know, it would be irresponsible for me to talk about these three imperatives and not show what we as a company are doing um, uh, to, to complement the purpose that we are saying. So I will show you a, a little um, example after this on what we've done in Singapore to help the society at large um, to live up to our purpose. But perhaps uh, questions um, yeah. first. Fantastic, yeah. So uh, a couple of questions, I think, from the participants that I'll share with you. One uh, uh, deals with sustainability is also an important concern, a lot of concern. Do you take that into consideration is one question. Yeah, 100%. We actually, in fact, we started working recently. I mean, the, the kinds of clients that we work with, we often look at how do we live up to uh, creating more human future. So if we were to work with companies that don't, you know, live up to that as our clients, then that would be responsible as well. So one of the latest companies that we started working with is a, it's kind of a startup actually in Singapore, but they're a, um, a secondhand um, electronics marketplace, Rubello. So um, the, the entire business is built around um, built around the circular economy. So how do we actually encourage people to buy secondhand devices that are refurbished rather than always buying new devices? Um, so that sustainability angle is, is, is absolutely there. So I think sustainability is 100% is uh, one of the key topics, um, uh, topics in, within this construct. Okay, very good, yeah. So another question uh, relates to your earlier imperative, the, uh, the purpose imperative. And so this participants as uh, you showed statistics on cancel culture and how if companies don't take a stand, that brand is likely to suffer. However, do you feel like the black clash, a backlash of these companies get where consumers take a stand against using such company products is more a short-term thing as opposed to a long-term one? As the issue loses clout, do you think consumers go back to using those brands? And if so, do you feel like companies know this and would therefore not take too seriously from branding perspective or active purpose standpoint? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say how how long standing some of these um, some of these backlashes really are. But nonetheless, especially if you were living through a pandemic where you know your your short term results matter as much as your long term results, I think you know keeping that in, in in consideration is pretty important for brands and companies as well. Um, and I think there are companies out there also who are purposefully taking a pretty strong stance on what they believe in, and therefore you know. Uh, they're, they're taking a, a strong stance is equally creating a counter movement. But, but I think some of those companies are, um, you know, b- believe that them standing by their values and the purpose they were created is far more important than alien, alienating some consumers, for example. So it just has to go back to, I, I actually fundamentally believe that when you have strong values that you believe in as a business, um, you stand by those values and you show those values, but you actually then also live by those values. And when you do that, you're, you know, uh, I would argue that you're that the statistics point towards having a more sustainable business in the future as well. Yeah, I think I, I sort of uh, uh, relate to this question a little bit because increasingly with this uh, polarity of, of of groups and consumers, I mean, uh, we see this. I think the most recently there was a guy from Goya uh, 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 products that suddenly became political because he was supporting Trump, and so. And, and there was a movement against boycotting all the Latinos, essentially boycotting Goya, or at least uh, the move towards it. And President Trump essentially puts Goya <laughs> products on his table, essentially promoting it. So you see what I'm saying? Uh, one research question as an academic I'd like to see is how many of these cancel culture uh, 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 or brands which essentially have been blacklisted at some point in time essentially are are, are still around, right? Or are there brands which essentially took a hit and, and basically did not survive? So I think that I, I, I relate to this question because it looks like it may be all fleeting. I mean, there may be an initial rush to judgment and people will say this, uh, but countering what you have earlier said, the millennials and the gener- uh, generation Z essentially seem to say that we're not gonna buy, 80% said we'll not buy if they have a scandal or if there are some issues relating to the brand. So I think it's still a potentially uh, a researchable topic is what I'm saying from, uh, I have not seen any evidence and we see this, a uh, lot of things in the press that come out when something like this blows up, but we don't see whether that actually has been sustaining uh, 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 or the companies have changed and that's why they're actually around, yeah. Yeah, I know that's, a, it's, it is a fan, uh, fascinating research topic and certainly a lot of these trends like cancel culture are relatively recent, um, especially in the intensity of, of the activism against companies. But again, I do stand by the, the sort, of, sort of notion that, you know, I, I believe that if you want to create a business for the future, you must stand for something good in the society. And I think those, those notions around purpose and profit going hand in hand are, are really, really important uh, as, as we build uh, businesses for the future. So. Um, I think, yeah, fascinating to see how long, long standing those, um, yeah. uh, those, uh, those sort of trends are. Would, would I risk it today as a business to, to, to see whether they are long standing or not? I don't think so, you know. So I, th- I think that's that's the the, the point that I want to make. Very good. Yeah, I, I think to a certain extent, the counter to any of these scandals that might crop up is to actually have this connected brand, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. To trust the brand and then. Occasionally, there's a there's a campaign against it. At least there's an openness and a connection that that the, the brand has made with its customers. So essentially, that yeah. can, that can shield it from some of these uh, controversies. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So um, we let you conclude, and then uh, uh, I'll invite all the participants to sort of uh, keep sending the questions. Uh, and and at the end of the the conversation, I think uh, Thomas will take more uh, more of your comments and questions. Absolutely. Go ahead, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah. So again, going back to this, to RGA's purpose, so creating a more human future. Um, when COVID started uh, hitting Singapore, we we as a team started thinking, well, what can we actually do? Something meaningful that we can do and put our uh, specialties and our expertise into use. And um, essentially, we we came up with something, which was uh, this community-driven platform that we wanted to create. And this is completely done sort of um, for the community, so there's no commercial um, uh, angle to this at this point. Um, and we, we were able to actually bring this to life in less than two weeks. So um, it just goes to show that innovation can happen during a crisis. And we wanted to see, uh, is there anything we can help? You bring design and technology to life in a meaningful way to essentially help protect the most vulnerable individuals of our society um, during a crisis. 
so we brought together a multidisciplinary team from our studio in Singapore and, and started ideating uh, potential solutions. And um, we wanted to have a scalable but sustainable journey um, and identify really what are the existing technologies that already are out there and can we bring those together to roll out a first version uh, in, in a couple of weeks and see if we can create something that would be, would be meaningful for, for the community. And we started really looking at the situation um, in Singapore and, and looking at a pandemic that exposed uh, the weak, weakest points of every country, really. Um, and we started looking at a particular audience in Singapore, which is um, Singapore seniors and how they're coping with the outbreak and really um, having this notion of a lot of social workers really going to the streets to make sure that seniors stay home and stay indoors and all that kind of stuff. And there was the situation in Singapore where despite all of these sort of government's continued calls for for this vulnerable group uh, that was more susceptible for the, the more severe impacts of COVID to stay home. Um, but ultimately, in some cases, they have to go out, they have to go to supermarkets, they have to go to the local coffee shops and grocery stores and just get essentials. Um, and not, or not all of them have the support network of being able to help do so. So is there a way for us to build use design and technology in a relevant way to make this happen? So we then came together and created a service that would really make a difference to the future of humanity in Singapore. And the service that we, we call it, I go for you. So an offer to help Singapore style, it's a phrase that every Singaporean has used at some point in their lives, suggesting that taking an initiative or going out of one's way to do someone a favor. So as a community, we're extending a connection to seniors with an act of kindness. Um, and I go for you is essentially a service that links seniors and senior citizens in Singapore that need groceries or a meal with people around the neighborhood who are willing to help. Um, and all it takes is one phone call. So what, the, what we want the system to be like is we understand that a lot of senior citizens don't have necessarily or, or are not necessarily willing to use apps and you know things like that. So we wanted that side of this service to be as simple as possible. So the only thing that you could do or you needed to do is pick up the phone and call. And there was an automated hotline that was launched in Mandarin and we're now looking into expanding into Malay and different dialects. So we also recognize that if we launch this in English, it's not necessarily going to have the same impact. So that was on, on one side. On the other side, we, we actually wanted to, uh, uh, the community of volunteers that are typically younger and typically more, more, more active, we wanted them to be, uh, be able to uh, take part in this in the way that they choose to. So while the senior citizens can use just a simple call, we used a service called Twilio, where you just key in your postal code, are you above 60, um, and basically had this system using Google Sheets that connected these requests uh, with volunteers on Telegram. So we started a Telegram group where the volunteers can very simply say yes or no if they want to help these particular requests. So it's a very, very simple um, uh, system on both uh, ends of the spectrum. And it's really built, built using existing technology, which just goes to show that innovation doesn't always require a really, really long roadmap. And, and we can create something very, very useful um, in, uh, in return. So just a, a quick sort of snapshot of what, what it looks like and the telegram, tele, telegram groups look like and some of the sort of discussions that have happened uh, on that um, and, and some of the sort of uh, publicity that was picked up around, um, around Singapore uh, with, with us launching this, this initiative. And a couple of the verbatims that have come. So um, uh, one of the MPs in Singapore basically uh, welcomed this initiative because it's a good application of technology that will imp improve the quality of life for seniors. Um, and lots of these sort of verbatims. And, and actually, we've had a lot of outreach from the community and some of the more sort of community centers around Singapore have actually wanted to, um, to take on this service because it helps them with their existing, um, existing outreach, community outreach programs. And really, uh, one, of the, one of the great uh, quotes here is that it's a good initiative that RGA has thought through to make it simple and intuitive for seniors specifically. So, um, I think this example shows um, a good response to one of the earlier questions that somebody asked in, in, in the first section. We could have done this as a mobile app. We could have done this as a website. We could have done it in any kind of way, but it was very important for us to design it to be so simple that the audience that we're trying to help um, are comfortable using it. And we use exactly the behaviors that they portrayed in wanting to use the service. And on the flip side, on the volunteer side, same thing. We wanted to bring this volunteer experience to life in the community that they're already in. So no point in building any separate apps. It can be as simple as a Telegram group where all the volunteers that want to be a part of this program 
can actually um, uh, indicate their willingness to, to help. So that's what I have for, for you guys today. Um, and Professor Srini, I'm very happy to answer any, any further, uh, further questions still. Okay. As we wait for any further questions that will come away, I have a couple of uh, things yeah, uh, that I, I sort of uh, wanted to ask you. Yeah. Uh, two things that came to mind as you were going through these three, um, uh, three uh, imperatives. Um, one uh, is, is on the companies uh, with an active purpose uh, 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 and, and how technology and design has actually helped them. And so th th it was very evident even in the short period of time that, that, uh, that since the COVID-19 has, has hit, uh, I'm just looking at a, a broad company perspective in terms of how some companies have been able to do well, even in the limited amount of time, and some have not. For example, in the grocery chain, I mean, we can talk all, always about Walmart and Amazon, how it ramped up and then so obviously uh, benefiting hugely in terms of profitability and also uh, stock value. But there are companies like Chili's, yeah, there's a restaurant chain that many of us are familiar with that. They used to have it in Tangling Mall, but I'm not sure if they have it still. Um, <clears throat> Chili's was having a great deal of problem because there were no customers coming in, right? Yeah. And so within the couple of month period, they actually launched a new brand called Wings, and which is a completely takeout, right? So you call and you pick it up. And they have actually, utilizing the kitchen facilities, they've used their chili facilities where people don't come in, but they use the chicken facilities on a very simple menu where you order uh, chilies in different uh, intensities. Yeah. And it has become a huge business. So suddenly what they've done, they turned the business around, created a new brand, and being able to be successful. So because the traditional business literally died overnight because of that. So, and I'm looking at Albertson is a grocery sort of chain, which essentially has done phenomenally well in transforming the businesses. So, and we see the same thing on the other side where companies like Neiman Marcus, which is a luxury department store, essentially filed for bankruptcy because they never built these technology, the, the, the brand, the be able to service the stuff using the new technology and so on. So this comes to mind in terms of how some firms do succeed, even in a rapid way, what, what you're talking about, uh, using design and technology to be able to sort of survive uh, even through this crisis. So I thought I'll share that with you. And if you have any other success stories or failure, that would be useful as well. Yeah, I mean, I fundamentally believe in that. And I think it was really uh, creativity and speed um, was were really two very, very, uh, very sort of key elements of this. And if you, uh, big brands aside, actually, SMEs have had to innovate all the same. Um, you know, you, you can have a small retail store that is not allowed to be open anymore. What do you do, you know? Um, and I think fundamentally the way where the, your good starting point for you as a company is to look at your assets. Yeah. What do you have? You know, what, what are the assets that you have that could be put into other kind of use? So there were the really obvious ones, which is, you know, can we start making masks and can we start producing water for frontline workers? And like th those are the really low hanging fruit uh, business ideas. But then as you look at small businesses, there's actually a Singaporean example as well. Um, there's a, I can't remember what the name of the actual restaurant was, but they're a sushi restaurant essentially. Hmm. And what they launched was this, essentially the same thing, which is take out only sushi. So they changed their, the kitchen facilities and the assets they had, uh, built a, an ordering website very quickly using existing technology, by the way. So existing payment frameworks and really simple ways to bring this website and this menu to life. Simplified menu with one guarantee. We will deliver fresh sushi anywhere on the island, mm -hmm. both islands actually, yeah. or all islands yeah. in Singapore within an hour. So, you know, that, that's a good example of the value proposition there is, all right, you know, I'm, I'm stuck at home now for months. I want sushi. I want it in an hour. I want it to be fresh. All right, there is a business. Um, and they, they were very quickly able to turn that around and been, have been incredibly successful. So many of these stories actually exist. And I fundamentally agree with you there. It's, it's look at your assets, create a way for customers to still be able to engage with you uh, and find new business to, uh, or new ways to make business. What's fascinating is how many of these things will carry through when restrictions open or yes. restrictions end um, okay. remains to be seen. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see. Some, some can, this wins idea seems to be, for, to me, is a great idea. So I, Yeah, I agree. So if they use the kitchen facilities, existing facilities to be able to do that. So one question that I, we just received is, on the participants said, how can SMEs uh, uh, spend reasonable amount of dollars? Yeah, I mean, so not too expensive to do the digital transformation. 
Uh, That's a great question. There's no better time than now, actually, because if you think about the platforms that are out there today and the, the you know, um, we actually call it uh, at RGA, we call it the lean, lean technology stack approach, which means that, you know, if you look at digital um, um, transformation 10 years ago, five years ago, you would have to buy these incredibly expensive content management systems and e-commerce platforms and payment systems. Today, you can sign up on Shopify for 10 bucks and all of a sudden you can accept payments, yep. right? So I actually think that creativity on how you transform your business is probably going to be even more important uh, than, than making it happen because making it happen, there's never been a better time to do that. There's a huge amount of different startups and, and leaner companies that do things like you know, remote video conferencing services, remote e-commerce services, even logistic services, even app builders and website builders and things like that, you know, go on Wix or Squarespace to build a website and, you know, start a Shopify store and, you know, use Google's um, a suite of products, for example, to bring certain things to life. So I, I actually think it's, it's imagination from a business perspective and creativity for business. Yeah. Look at what your business is in today. Look at whether there's a, a, an unmet need somewhere and then, you know, scour the web for the sort of, minimum viable solution to make that happen. And I think consumers will buy. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Uh, so uh, uh, what, what, what we'll do is uh, 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 if you're willing to sort of at least give a portion of, of the, uh, the presentation, yeah, which, is, which we can distribute, it'll sure. be great. Yeah, so, and, and, uh, so because there, there have been several requests from participants to see if you can share. Yes. And uh, we, we will uh, uh, reach out to them and then send, send the edited uh, version of your presentation. So as, as usual, uh, Thomas, it's absolutely a delight uh, to have you. Each time I, I, I get you back, yeah, there are some fantastic new ideas. Yeah, In whatever role you are in, you're always bringing in some incredibly creative ideas, which I think all of us uh, can benefit from. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much for taking the time and initiating this innovative virtual seminar series this this year, so we hope to have several of them in the coming weeks. Appreciate you yeah, coming in. Absolutely, thank yeah. you very much for having me. I really enjoyed it, and thank you everybody for uh, sticking along. Hopefully, there are some insights that everybody can use. So, uh, again, thank you very much, and have a great day. Yeah, thank you all participants, and hope to catch up with you guys again soon. Bye bye. Bye.